I'm um, really glad to be here. We've heard a lot about like open source communities and student communities and online communities. Um, I'm here to talk a bit about communities that practice internally in corporations or like other tech companies. So I work for JP Morgan. I'm based in Bournemouth. Um, we have about 4,500 people working for us and a third are developers or software engineers, basically kind of like old technologists. And we have communities of practice. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of points. Um, we're going to start with some definitions of how we see communities of practice and brands. Um, we're going to tell you a bit about our story, crafting the brand, and then a survival kit um, for how you can manage your internal communities of practice. So um, we look at our communities of practice from a domain, community, and practice perspective. So basically, who cares about it? What is it that we care about? Um, and what we do together about it? Basically, the main bit is the community, but then also that you have a shared struggle. So you're both, or more people, there to learn about the same thing. This is a definition. There are a lot of definitions. Um, but the key things you're going to recognize are the domain, the community, and practice. So like, you have the collection of individuals coming together to share any kind of knowledge, ideas, content, workshops, anything around the particular topic. So in our case, we have things like Kubernetes community of practice. We have um, Python. We have user experience. We have front-end development. We have uh, product management. We have production owners. We have a lot of different communities on a lot of different topics. Now, the brand side is that we've decided to take them all together and put them under a framework. And we call it Ignite. Um, this is our brand, and we have it in about 20 different tech centers around the world. So we don't only collaborate locally, we also collaborate globally, but we do put a big emphasis on um, in-person interactions. So I like the previous talk because it, it kind of iterated the importance of meeting people physically. Um, and we encourage online sharing of information, we encourage virtual chat rooms, but we always want you to supplement that with in-person meetings. So there's, there's really nothing quite like coming together with people in your area or that are interested in the same subject to actually kind of engage at the same time, in the same atmosphere, in the same room. Um, so we are strong, strong advocates of in-person meetings uh, or in-person workshops, in-person sessions. Obviously, because we're a global company, we share a lot of this cross-location. So we have cybersecurity communities throughout the globe, and they meet together to share content, best practices within themselves. But we take that back to our in-person local communities. So I really like this description of a brand um, as the essence of one's own unique story. And obviously, a lot of people associate a brand with a logo. But actually, the brand goes way beyond that. The brand is basically why people trust you and what they trust you to do and what you promise you're going to do. So brand and trust go hand in hand in a way um, because it's really, really important for your brand to build trust in the people that you're addressing. But then if you lose that trust, your brand suffers. And I can think of a couple of examples of companies that, that had that recently. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our story, where we started, where we're not at now. Um, and then we're going to move on to kind of the practical applications and things that we think are important when you're building your communities of practice. So before I start, I will say that we had communities of practice that were dispersed in about 2017-18. So they didn't get the support or the funding um, or kind of the exposure that they wanted and they needed. So Ignite basically brought all of them together and we were able to actually support them, manage them, and offer them more resources this way. Um, I don't know how many people, how many people work here in organizations that are more than, let's say 5,000 people? Yeah, so I think you understand my pain of trying to get budget allocated for this kind of things. Uh, so like the community side and not something that's directly related to a business value and the amount of like paperwork and processes and approvals that you need to go through is really, really hard. So 
In 2017, in our Glasgow office, Ignite was born. Um, in February 2018, um, we started getting awareness of it in Bournemouth. And uh, I reached out to our, to our friends in Glasgow, and I was like, hey, we'd really like to start this in Bournemouth as well. Um, we already had some communities, three, and we wanted them to go forward, and we wanted people to come to us and be like, do you know what? We're really passionate about Python. We really want to start a community. We really want to make this kind of like a center of excellence in our hub where people can come and ask questions, learn more, start their journey on learning Python. And then in April 2018, we officially onboarded the existing communities after we had like a talk and a, a kind of like, how do you want us to proceed with this? What do you need from us? What are your struggles? How can we make this work together? And then something amazing happened. In June 2018, after we launched, kind of like softly, people started coming to us and being like, hey, we heard that you can help us with this. We really wanted to start this community. How can we make this happen? And we do have a framework and a process for how you can start a community, things that you need to think about, people that are interested. Um, we also have a portal where people can upvote topics of communities that they want to start or that they're interested in. And then we kind of like, take the process and reach out and are like, so who would like to lead it? Um, how many people would like to join it? Kind of like more of the admin side of, of running it. So now we're at 15 communities. Um, we did reach a peak of 20, but I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, and we have seven core team members. So the core team members are not necessarily community leads, but they look after all of the communities. Um, we've run like over 300 sessions. Um, we have 100 exciting brand assets because we like to keep our brand consistent. Um, so we kind of like share it among all of the locations. And if anyone makes a new brand asset, they put it in a repo and we all have access to it. Um, we've started running colliders, which are basically internal external events where we bring um, external meetups from the local area to collide with our internal meetups, um, meetups, internal communities with the external meetups. Um, we also run a conference program for anyone that wants to go on a conference and bring back the knowledge to the community and the hub. And we're now also running master classes, which are basically um, day-long activities that start with a keynote, and then we have workshops throughout the day for our own internal communities. So. We have learned that it's very, very important that you always keep in mind that you are there to serve the people in the communities. Um, they're mostly self-organizing. We're there for support and for help. We're not there to dictate what they should be talking about, what they should be presenting, the workshops they should be running. We are there to help them if they need to promote their events, if they need budget, if they need support, if they need someone to talk to if they need to create a succession plan, anything, we're there for them. So, crafting the brand. Now, I'm not saying this will work for everyone, um, but this is, after three years kind of like on, um, what we've seen that works. And it's kind of like our, our cyclical process. Um, plant the seed, so bring people together, whether it is one community or 10, you still want to bring them together. Again, that really important bit about physical meetups inside of your company. Yes, it's fine to supplement with webinars. We do webinars when maybe, let's say, Glasgow has a, a session and we want to have our communities attend. We're going to offer them a webcast to be able to tune in. But that doesn't replace the fact that we still bring people in one room to watch it. We don't let them log in from, from their desks. Um, because we want them to feel like they're part of the community. We don't just want them to be like, well, this is like a content source for me, but I'm never going to engage. Um, help it grow and thrive. Make roadmaps. Um, I've heard this in open source before. When you start an open source project, maybe think a bit about the vision. So like, how will you maintain it? How is it going to grow? What's going to happen in the future? So we look at, OK, we're starting, we're helping a community start out. We want them to tell us, what do you think you're going to be doing in six months? Do you think there's enough interest and passion 
to keep on going? Do you have enough time to keep on going? Do you need more people to help you? So all of these are really important questions to ask your communities when they're forming because it will make them shape a little bit the idea of, well, actually, I know what I'm doing next week, but I should probably start thinking about what am I going to do next month, the month after that? Do I want other people to take over? Can I actually dedicate the time for this? We don't want you to fail. We want to help you. But you need to be honest with yourself. Do you have the commitment and the time to do this? And then don't forget to prune. So I said that we had at 1.20 communities. Communities come and go. People hop on a trend or have more spare time, and then they hop off. Or community leads leave, and they, they don't have anyone that wants to pick up after, after they formed. But we retire the community. We move it to kind of like this retired space. Um, and if anyone else, maybe in a year, wants to come back and they're like, do you know what, that Python community was really good. And like, I know loads of people that want to learn more. Can I revive that? It's like, yeah, sure. Why not? Everything's there. If you need us to like help you revive it, awesome. Um, but it's really important because if you have people sign up for the communities internally and they expect to get updates, invites, whatever they send, and there's radio silence, people are going to be like, that's a waste of my time. They do nothing. Why did I even sign up? And it might be that like, if they signed up for another one, they would have got like, loads of information, loads of opportunities to learn, but they just chose that one that's not active. So if you don't tell people it's not active, they're expecting someone to, to reach out. And that can affect your brand. Um, even though it's an internally offered kind of like service, people still expect a really good service. So these are our four C's for COPs. Um, content's really important. Uh, succession plan's important. Sharing resources is important. Because if I create a Kubernetes workshop and I share it with my counterparts in Dallas, they don't need to put in 10, 20 hours of work to create it. And we keep our delivery consistent, we keep our content consistent, and we can help each other if anything goes wrong, because we're both on the same side. Cross-pollination, we're now having kind of like self-organizing communities that are coming together and saying, do you know what? Like Kubernetes and cybersecurity could go really well together. And we're like, awesome. Just throw something together, organize it, and we're going to support you. Tell us what you need. And we don't have to go to them and tell them do this. They just want to do it because it's kind of like a, a natural coming together of, oh, you do something really cool, and I do something really cool, and we could do something really cool together. Um, consistency, throughout our journey here, we have realized that consistency is key. In events, in room bookings, like if you have your workshop every second Thursday of the month in the same room, people do it and they show up automatically, it just becomes a reflex. You don't have to check what room are you in, what time is it, is it going to be on this month, is it not going to be on next month? Um, so it makes it really, really easy. Again, with the marketing, everyone knows our brand, everyone knows when they receive an email or a notification that's from us. Um, and we enforce that in a way with our brand repo. We tell them, everyone needs to use this if you want a new asset and you can't make it yourself. Let us know and we'll design it. Um, and commitment. We want to ensure that the people in the room are the right people. And we want to make sure that you, you're not there because you're fearing that you're going to miss out on something. You're there because it's something you care about, you learn, and you share. It's not something that's mandatory. It's a passion project. And Actually, a lot, of our, um, a lot of our members say that they would have never learned the things that they've learned if it wasn't for the connections that they've made through those in-person interactions. So these are a couple of examples of things that we do. Um, so that's our brand repo that I was talking about, um, that we have like, loads of different assets from like, templates to like, banner templates to logos for different communities to um, email templates for like events like the Collider. Then we have cross-location blogs. So we like to keep 
it consistent with posting. So we encourage people, if they're attending an event, if they ran a workshop, if they found something interesting, if they read something interesting, share it with other locations. Because once you post it there, everyone in our global community can see it. And everyone can learn from it. And then make it fun. Uh, we, learned, we, well, we learned that <laughs> um, we're now doing like these cross-community cross um, kind of like sessions. And we're running something called the Leader Summit where we bring all our community leads together and they kind of like share their struggles. Um, and sometimes it's actually really nice to see them being like, well, do you know what? Like that happens to me too. And then trying to solve it together. So we're just there as facilitators. We, we don't really drive it. We want them to drive it because it's their community, it's their project, it's their passion that they're putting into it. So why would I tell them like, no, you should be doing it this way? If they need help and they need guidance, we're always there. But we don't want it to be a kind of like, but I told you to do it that way. So put together a starter kit. Probably need to run through it pretty quickly. Um, these are four things that we've realized are really important for us as a community of practice kind of like organization. One is life cycle support, second is brand assets, third is playbooks, and fourth is strong core team. So for life cycle and brand support, we have written out an entirely kind of like cyclical um, guide on how we expect communities to like form and what we have seen that happens with communities over time. <clears throat> And this is kind of like informed from social learning theory, from like building successful communities of practice, if anyone's read the book. Um, and basically, we're adding to our framework to cater for things like we need to retire a community. Obviously, when we started this journey, everything was new. So there was no need to retire someone. But now, kind of like two, three years later, some communities are not active anymore, so you need to put in place a process to deal with what happens when they don't want to continue. Um, and also we have in our core team, so we're seven in Bournemouth, we all have two or three communities that we regularly attend, keep in contact, so we're their first port of call if anything happens or they need anything. So they have, they know this is your human, if anything happens, they're there for you. Um, the next bit is playbooks. So this is an example of the one that we did for the Collider. Um, and basically, this was like a joint effort. I started writing it out and laying it out. And then we use kind of like an open source model. Everything is open for anyone to contribute. So I did the draft and the skeleton. And then all the other locations that have organized colliders came in and added things that I was missing, or that might not apply to me, but apply to other locations. Um, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel. <laughs> we always want to share skills and, and knowledge, because there's no point in me spending 20 hours to do something and you spending 20 hours. And then it's actually almost the same, because we did, we did the same thing. Um, and also, we want to have a smooth succession planning. And I think someone earlier said, <laughs> um, there's no such thing as too much documentation. Lika said that. Um, and I agree. Like, there, there is no such thing as having too many assets, too many playbooks. Someone at some point will need that. And if you don't have it, they won't have a, a way to ask for help. And finally, we have a strong core team. So every six months, we talk to our core team. And we're honest. And we're saying, do you have the time for this? If someone happens to kind of like trail off and you don't hear from them, you don't see them, they don't really engage in any way, as part of the core team, I go to them and I'm like, hey, do you want to grab a coffee? Are you okay? Do you want to talk about something? Because I want to make sure that they're okay. I don't want to give them more to stress about and think that they're missing out on, on providing the kind of like effort that we need. Um, so I want them to be OK, to be able to support our communities and be happy with doing that. Um, we also have a global community. So obviously, 
we meet with our counterparts in all the other locations as core teams, and we share what our struggles are. So our struggles will be different from our community leads, but we still meet to share what we think we could do better. And we have monthly in-person core team meetings. We also meet occasionally if we're having something fun to do. Um, we also do a charter workshop where we say what we can and can't do. So any community that goes onto our charter kind of like page can see these are the things that we can help with. These are the things that we can't, but you can still ask us because we might know the answer. Um, and these are the things we definitely don't do. So they know what our expectations are and they know what to ask or what is in our remit to help with. And here are some people that I follow in the community space. Um, they're from various backgrounds. Some of them were and are in this room. Um, but I find that sometimes just seeing some of their, their tweets or comments makes me rethink some of the things that we do and improve the things that we do. So sometimes it's nice to see people from other community areas um, and how do you do things. And again, crafting a brand of communities of practice internally or externally is great, um, but maintaining a strong brand is the hard part and maintaining the trust of people is the hard part. Thank you. <laughs>